Good morning, Valley Grace. We're so glad you've decided to join us this morning on this beautiful day, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers in here. Um, we have some announcements this morning, starting with Pastor Doug. Thank you. Just a real quick reminder, next Sunday, right after this service, special business meeting to approve uh, some an, an expense for some updates in the sound equipment. Again, there's sheets at the Welcome Center with some information, or come and ask me next week, right after the service. And uh, I'll have an announcement now. Um, I just want to thank you guys so much for your support for the youth. Uh, with the Momentum Youth Conference, uh, you guys, through spaghetti dinner, lunch sales, and everything, you guys raised well over half of all that the kids owed, and we have nine kids going, and it's over $500 a kid, so just thank you guys for all of your support. Um, yep. <laughs> and so we do have one final uh, lunch sale uh, today, which is Pastor Doug's Smoked Meats. They'll be right out here in the uh, uh, cafe. This will help uh, with their trip to go out to Cedar Point before uh, Momentum, which will be an awesome time. They're looking forward to that. And gas, uh, any food costs, and all the other things that come along with going on a trip with 15 people. So thank you guys very much for your support. And uh, yeah, we love you guys and uh, are so glad that you're supporting our youth here. Let's stand and worship together this morning.
love that casts out fear. You are worthy.
faithful and just to lead us back to you and lord we are thankful that uh we have the gift of you as our great lord and our good father god just that uh, we can celebrate each day that you have called us your children because of what you've done through christ and lord we uh just thank you for that love that you've given to us as a father and lord we thank you this day for our, our earthly fathers you've given to us lord just the love that you have shown to us through them and uh, through the figures that uh, have been fathers to us in our lives, God, just that we know what your love is like because you've provided great role models in this life. Lord, I just thank you so much for every good blessing that you give us. And God, it's all in your name we pray. Amen. It's a jungle out there. Every day, our kids encounter questions about their faith. Did God create everything? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I really trust the Bible? At the Great Jungle Journey, kids will explore the answers to these questions and more as they embark on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. As your children sail along on a fun jungle cruise, they'll stop at seven ports of call, the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. Kids will discover how these events shape our world, and they will realize their need for a savior as they reconnect the Bible to their everyday lives. Prepare to swing into fun on the Great Jungle Journey. Okay, tomorrow, tomorrow night, yes! 6, 8.30 here at the church. I gotta tell you, I was talking to someone today. I've done Bible school since I was 12. I went to Bible school since I was three. I love Bible school. Answers in Genesis has like the best stuff. So we're gonna talk about all these things that they kinda hear, but they're really in the Bible and why they're important and boy are we excited. Our mission project, we've done, we've done a combination in the past between local things and overseas. And this year we're focusing on Haiti. Since it's a jungle theme, we're gonna talk about Haiti, guys, because of uh, natural disasters, earthquakes and stuff, because of political corruption, hmm, that fits in. People are starving, children are starving. $30 feeds a family for a week. So we're not doing boys against girls, we're doing um, grades, we're doing groups, two groups against two groups. And let's see what we can do. Let's see how much money we can raise. We always put something in the church email if you'd like to contribute, but we're helping Haiti with their famine. That's what we're doing this year for our mission project. So um, as far as I know, we are fully staffed. If 
you're just hanging out, and we all know Survivor doesn't come back on until fall, so you have nothing to do this week. Come on out, come on out. Count pennies, because I can't, because it's a long story. Come on out, count money. Um, you can help, I know food is taken care of, come on and help. Sit in a classroom, there's so much, and it's just so much fun. So, does anyone have any questions before I stop? Okay. So anyway, 6 to 8.30 tomorrow, Friday is our big water night, um, our aquatic adventure, and so that's always a big deal. 6 to 8.30, come on out, can't wait to see you there, and pray for us. Pray for that children hear the word of God and come to really know Jesus, the creator of all things. Thanks. I don't know what to do. Huh, never seen that place before. Oh, hey, welcome to the dad store. Is there something I can help you find? Hey, yeah, uh, so Father's Day is tomorrow and God forgot to give my dad a gift, so I'm just looking for something nice that I can get him. Well, you're in luck because we only sell items that people have actually given to their dads on Father's Day. Oh, well, that's, that's perfect. Yes, for example, you could get him this toilet bowl nightlight. It lights up your toilet bowl so it's easy to find at night. Um, yeah, that's not exactly what I had in mind. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what about this screaming goat stress reliever? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's disturbing. How about this beard bib? You know, for shaving. Well, he doesn't have a beard, so. I'm sure he'd love this book of dad jokes. Please, no. He does not need that. What about these pajama pants with your face on them? Wait, where did you get that picture of me? We have a wide selection of dad-related mugs. Uh, I think he has enough mugs. Huh? Huh? Mm, no. A bacon scented air freshener. Instant underpants. Handmade macaroni artwork. Oh, okay, stop, stop. You know, I guess I'm just looking for something a little more meaningful, you know? Oh. Well, honestly, what your dad really wants is probably just to know that you love him, that you appreciate all the things he's done for you, and that you think he's a good example of a man who follows Jesus. And you could tell him all those things, or you could write them down and give that to him. You know, you're right. <laughs> of course you're right. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Thanks. Sure. And that would look great on this hilarious card, which reads, Best Dad by Par. Oh, come on. Well, we will be interested to hear who has received any of those fine gifts uh, <laughs> next week. Happy Father's Day. Blessed ha uh, Father's Day to those of you who are dads. Um, very little uh, that is greater privilege and very little that is a greater challenge, but a greater pr uh, opportunity as well. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, just to bring you up to date on a few things, uh, in your handout, hopefully you read this on occasion, uh, it's, it's mentioned the fact that next week, uh, following this service, we need to get together as, as a church congregation. There's an item that needs to be decided by you. Uh, we are congregationally governed, and in our Constitution, it says if it's, not over, if it's over X number of dollars, we want the church family to, to have the input on that. And so there's an information on the back and further information out at the Welcome Center. It'll be after the morning service should not be very long. You can do the research. You can ask questions ahead of time. Uh, email church, email Pastor Doug, uh, information about, hey, I'm, I'm wondering about, but there is a handout that explains uh, what, we are, what we are trying to do and, and why that uh, is being uh, given to you as, as, a, as a recommendation from the church board. Last week, I made reference to this. Many of you are out also involved in helping to set out and do those kinds of things so that we could enjoy a, a great weekend. Uh, thank you for those of you who were involved in that. Just a really neat opportunity to reach community and 
Uh, some of you did work in advance, some of you during there, set up, tear down, interaction with uh, community people. It was just absolutely fantastic. So thank you for doing that. We needed that help. Last weekend, a lot going on. Friday was a memorial service for uh, Betty Hardcastle, and some of you were involved in helping to serve the family for that. Thank you for that. And then Friday night was uh, the youth drama, spaghetti dinner, and all of those pieces. So it was a great weekend, and well done, church. Uh, because of your investment with time, talent, and treasure, uh, Brandon mentioned that last week, uh, we were able to offer to the community just, uh, hey, we, we care about you, this is hospitality, and we're interested in that. Also, as a result of, of your investment uh, in Valley Grace and We Can Invest, and this was mentioned last week also, but again, some of you were not available. Um, we have partnered with Hickory Schools, elementary schools, for over 20 years, and um, Betty Vance is, is retiring, and so she dropped off a certificate that says, thank you for partnering with us for 20 years as a church family. We we made facilities available, we provided food at times, we did whatever we could, and uh, bicycles and uh, shoes and, and all of those kinds of things. Also, uh, Betty, uh, Becky dropped off just a certificate saying, in a very special way, thanks to Leslie Brink because she's been our point of contact through our missions team. Uh, events of last week were planned and organized through the missions team. Our interaction with um, Hickory uh, is through the missions team, but, but uh, Leslie was our contact person. So, Leslie, we have something for you from Becky. Please come on up. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. But if you want to, you can. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie, for, for doing that for us, allowing us to partner. So, thanks. Well done, well done. A few announcements just to bring you up to date um, regarding individuals that we continue to pray for. Uh, continue to pray for Sue Poffenberger. Sue is Carol and, and uh, Tim Clark's um, sister. Uh, she's just got back from University of Maryland dealing with cancer started in the leg. It has metastasized. So this is, a, this is a long journey and she appreciates prayer and she says thank you for your prayers. Uh, that you've had on her behalf, but continue to pray for her. She is in Williamsport, uh, assisted living at this point in time, recovering from some of those things. Pastor Ray had mentioned last week had a stroke, and he is down now getting rehab at Meredith, making really good progress. So thanks for your prayers on behalf. Um, still uh, open to visitors if you'd like. He's on the third floor now in, in rehab. Uh, make, again, making some really good progress. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for the privilege we have to gather. We've sung about your goodness to us, and we look around us and see what you've accomplished for us. And Lord, in a very special way, thanks, thanks for our dads that uh, have impacted us uh, in the best way they could. Uh, some maybe weren't what we would expect, and yet we see their imprint and their thumbprint. We're thankful for that. And Lord, for those who are dads here raising families for you, uh, God, give them wisdom, a great privilege, a great responsibility uh, to raise and launch the next generation. Obviously, it takes moms as well, and so we're thankful for their input also. Uh, Father, I pray now that as we open up uh, your scripture, the Bible you've given to us, the, the only book that you've written to instruct us about life and to help uh, get through all the maze and the fog of stuff uh, that is thrown at us, supposedly... Uh, in religious circles, Lord, that we would understand your heart. And so I pray that you would instruct us, you would challenge us uh, through your truth. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our journey through the Gospel of Matthew that, that teaches us about who Jesus is and what, he, what he's done. It, it also reminds us of what the heart of God is all about. Because if you remember last section that we were in together, Jesus basically told us, as he told his disciples, that, that, I am communic that Jesus is communicating God. This is what God is like. And so what you see of Jesus tells us about what God is really like. Since Jesus and God are both God, and they're, they're distinct personalities, but they have the characteristic that makes them God. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is also God as well. 
And Matthew, as we work our way through this particular gospel, there's a reason why Matthew ties things together. These aren't just random things that he throws and there's, "Ah, I think I'll write about this today, and I think I'll write about that tomorrow. There's a reason, there's a logic behind what he has put. We, We take certain chunks of, of, of the text, because if we tried to handle all of it at one setting, uh, we'd need pizza delivery today and tomorrow and, and whatever else, you know, it would just take us a while. And there's so much in each one that we want to be able to go away, take away something from, from the text. And so what we come to today is logically tied to what we looked at last week. And Jesus is addressing the concept of what it means uh, to, to, to be a follower of Christ. If you've got a Bible open, and if you want to follow along in a Bible that's in the chair rack, it's in page 969. We're going to back up just a little bit before we jump into chapter 12 to understand what Jesus means and why he puts this particular section here that he does. And so when, when we left off in Matthew chapter 11... We, we pick it up in verse 28 that Jesus says there, by the way, 26 is, was, yes, Father, for this is the well-pleasing. All things have been handed to me and uh, by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father and the one to whom the Son reveals. That's what Jesus is saying. I and the Father are, are, are on the same page. We, we think the same way, and I'm communicating to you, and then I will reveal myself to you. So that's what it means by that. And then in verse 28, come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so it's within that context that Matthew says, I want to tell you some lessons. I want to give you some lessons about the Sabbath. In the Jewish uh, ceremony, there's very little... There are a few things that are more important, but the Sabbath ranks very, very high in how they carried out their religious duties, how they saw themselves in, in that aspect. And so in Jesus' day, it was very, very important. And, and today, we, we look at it, and even in religious circles today, and, and many have burdened uh, individuals down with Sabbath obligations that have been given many rules and regulations that Jesus never gave, but were expanded upon to say this is what it means. So there are rules and regulations that are given that are not biblical, that were made up by man, and we call that legalism. That someone says, for example, you know, the, the, the fourth commandment was you shall worship the Lord your God. And you're not to work on that day. That's Exodus uh, about 20 verses 9, 10 in that particular section. Well, then, so what does that mean not to work? Jesus, God didn't spell out any further than I want you to do this. And, And so what the Jewish individuals ended up doing was creating what does it mean to not work? What is work? Because we want to keep the day holy, so we don't want to do that which is is work. And so the Jewish religious leaders took over 200 years, from about 200 B.C. to 180, to come up with a commentary called the Mishnah that gave to them instruction on what is work. And there are like 39 chapters, if you want to put it that way, of what work is, explaining what work would be like, what it would look like, what is work and what is not work. For example, and we've had some of these stories before, you could go three quarters of a mile on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. You could go three quarters of a mile, but if you went over that, you were working. Hence, we get the term, you've read about it in Scripture, and they went a Sabbath day's journey, three quarters of a mile. Well, that's pretty limited, isn't it? And so they made, the the Jewish leaders made some ways that you could get around some of these rules because they were so restrictive. So the way to get around this rule was that if you would take food and you would put it, it'd have to be on a Friday, uh, you know, three quarters of a mile, you know, down the road, you could go three quarters of a mile down so that you could pick up your food because that was then considered, that point was then considered to be an extension of your home. I don't understand the logic. 
but they needed some way to go farther. So, in, you know, possibly every three quarters of a mile you put food, that was your home, you know? So I guess you could go as far as you wanted to go. You couldn't carry a load, you know, because that's work heavier than a dried fig. Well, that's pretty limiting. You can't eat anything larger than an olive. So all of your food had to be prepared on Friday, and then it had to be very, very small bites because you couldn't cut it. It had to be already good to go, and it couldn't be more than, than an olive in size. You couldn't light a fire. You couldn't light uh, your candles. You couldn't burn food, you know, uh, make food. You couldn't have a campfire. Uh, ladies, you'll find this one interesting. Maybe you won't. Um, women were not allowed to look in a mirror. Do you know why? Because if you saw a gray hair, you'd be tempted to pull it, and that'd be harvesting. <laughs> the drama continues. And so you're not allowed to look in a mirror. There were a lot of other ones that we're not going to waste our time on this morning. But these rules and regulations actually turn dangerous. Because according to this, you could not uh, be involved in battle, offensive or defensive. And so uh, Antiochus Epiphanes during the Maccabean revolt, the Maccabees would not fight on Saturday. And so that's when Antiochus Epiphanes came in and slaughtered men, women, and children because they were not able to pick up weapons to defend themselves. Pompey did the same thing when he was attempting to uh, give siege to Jerusalem and you build siege works, which, uh, you know, big walls, and so you carry a lot of dirt and you have to put it up against the walls. But if you get too close, it could be very dangerous, right? So they did all the carrying of the dirt and siege work on Sabbath, the Sabbath day on Saturday, because no one was going to stand up and, and oppose them. And so Jerusalem fell. Now there was a... Um, uh, uh, an exception that was ultimately made that, okay, because of these kinds of things, the enemies are seeking to destroy us through these kinds of things. Therefore, we can be on defense, but we cannot be on offense. 1967, Six-Day War, where Israel was surrounded by enemies who were getting ready to attack them. And Israel actually attacked first, June 5th, I believe it was, and that was a Monday. They didn't do it on the Sabbath. Guess what day October 7th was of last year? A Sabbath. When Hamas hit Israel. Some of you were raised in very legalistic homes. With very restrictive rules. Women were not allowed to wear shorts. They couldn't wear pants. You couldn't wear jewelry. You couldn't put on makeup because, you know, that perhaps would lead to pride or something of that nature. Pam and I were sitting, when we were shortly after we were married, we were at a banquet and we had an older couple across the table from us. And somehow we got onto this particular topic. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of interesting to find out, you know, where, where, where does this older couple f fall? And the gentleman said, well, I've always said... If the barn needs painting, you paint it. <laughs> you can see where he fell, which is fine, which is fine. There's nothing in the Bible that you can't. But there were those who said, you know, you, you can't do that. Seemed to be less restrictive for men. Uh, the only ones that I kind of remember, you know, from college days, because, you know, that was uh, part of the, the, the direction there. One of them was, you, you know, guys can't have long hair, and they would tell you how long it could be, couldn't touch the collar and all those other kinds of things. And also at this college, uh, guys were not allowed to wear beards. And I, I, you know, but the interesting thing is we would go on retreat up to uh, Epworth Forest, which was kind of, um, you know, they had the pictures of some of the founders of, and early folks of, of the, the, the movement. They all had beards. And so there are those, you know, some, some have grown up, you can, when you go to church, you can only go to church on Sunday morning, you can't do anything that's enjoyable because that just wouldn't be right to have a joy on a, on, a sad, on a Sunday, which they would say is the Sabbath. It's not the Christian Sabbath. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. You can't do anything outside, especially if it's fun. 
Go up to Lancaster County, you'll find those who have very, very restrictive rules of what you can and can't do. And sometimes when we go up there, say, boy, this would be relaxing, except if you had to live under that for, you know, for weeks and weeks and years and years. And, and so out of this very restrictive topic in which Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Matthew says, now let's take a look at the Sabbath laws. Are they designed to be as restrictive as what we see? And I want us to see this morning that God gives to us his principles and precepts for our flourishing and not to be a burden. God's principles and precepts are for our flourishing and not to be a burden. So I want to demonstrate that to you this morning. Before we jump into the text, though, I think a little bit of background on the Sabbath is going to be very important for us. Where did it all start? It all started way back in Genesis chapter 2. And we read that what God has done is he has finished, he has completed uh, making heaven and earth, speaking it into existence, creating it except for when he made man where he knelt down, fashioned into, out of clay, a man and breathed into him, you know, the breath of life and took a hunk of flesh out of the side of man to make a woman. So, and so... That's the only real hands-on kind of thing that we kind of read about that God does, which is kind of interesting. You know, it's, it's using human terminology for us to understand. And, and so after six days of creation with mankind, Adam and Eve being the, uh, the pinnacle of his creation on, on day six, we read that on the seventh day, God rested. Now, it's important for us to understand it's not because God was tired, it wasn't like God said, whew, that's really been a lot of work. God didn't get tired at all. He never, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, he doesn't grow in strength, he doesn't lose strength, he doesn't gain more wisdom. He, he, it, it, was, it was to be a pattern. It was to be a pattern that, on, on, uh, that we need in our work and in our calendars, we need rest. We need rest. Maybe some of you have had conversation recently, and I have as well. We look in our culture, and man, there's a lot of rage out there, isn't there? I mean, we hear the road rage, we hear about road rage, somebody just, hey man, you know, the slightest thing can set us off, and I think a lot of that has to do because we don't take rest as God determined for us to stop and do something different in our routines, to take a time of rest. So Genesis 2-3 is where it is instituted by God. And then we come into Exodus chapter 20, where God says here to Israel, I want you to have a day of rest. And what's it to be? It's to be a time of rest. You don't do regular activity like you do all the time, but it's a time of worship. So it's worship and rest. Now, God does not go into specifics with what that looked like as far as the Jewish people were concerned. Just worship and rest. Worship and rest. Break the rhythms. And so as a result, it was designed to be a blessing. God didn't say how far you could travel. God didn't say what you could or couldn't eat. God didn't say you, you can and light a match or you can't light a match. You can light a candle. You can't light a candle. God never said any of that. He just said, here's what I want you to do. It's designed to be a blessing to you. But the Jewish community had made it into a heavy yoke. And that's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Yoke is putting ourselves under submission to Christ. Rejecting Christ is a heavy burden. But my yoke is easy. It doesn't mean life is easy. But God, Jesus doesn't put all kinds of restrictions to make our life miserable. But that's what many of the Jewish folks had done. And, and so in Exodus 20, a, a day of worship and a day of rest, you would read about the, the Jews going into the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, New Testament tells us, to worship. Jesus is still under Old Testament economy. It's not the church age yet. All right, so then what about Sunday as the Lord's day, okay? Okay. Well, it is, we are called upon to worship. Some of you remember when we arrived 35 plus years ago, Maryland had blue laws. 
you know, there were certain things you could and couldn't do. And uh, when we lived on Virginia Avenue, you know, our next door uh, market was closed, which is always nice. We had extra parking. Was the liquor store. <laughs> you know, and so we had extra parking and it was just nice. There wasn't any traffic in and out. And, and, and so it was just a nice, it was just, you know, the blue laws. In fact, you could go into a store and some things from what I'm told would be covered because you're allowed to buy certain things and others you can't. And they would say, why? Because we're making this the Christian Sabbath. Well, that's not what it is. The, the day of worship was changed and the early church from Sabbath, the Saturday to Sunday. And we read about that in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where there is a change that, that the church would get together on the, on the first day of the week to do what? To worship. To worship. And so we are called to meet together. And Acts 2 gives to us the pattern of the early church. They met together to worship, to praise God, to pray, to give, to be involved in fellowship, to do a number of things. They did it regularly. So there is a pattern. They had, they had the Lord's Supper. But Sabbath, Jesus also said, Sabbath is for the people. The people weren't made for the Sabbath. In other words, God didn't say, okay, here's my rules, and I need people just to be able to follow these rules. God's, Jesus is saying, no, the rules are there for your benefit. The Sabbath rest is for you. You need it. I didn't make a bunch of rules just so that I could have people submit to rules. This is for you. This is for you. It's to be a blessing. And so we gather today, we gather together on Sunday. Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a habit of some is. And there are a lot of one another's that we're called to do in the Bible that, to interact with one another, pray with one another, encourage one another, do those kinds of things. So regular worship is to be part of our life. Now, how often is that? Some of you recall, you know, back in the day, we had Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Oh, that, was, that, was, that was hard work. It was hard work. And they were beneficial, but the Bible doesn't tell us how often. We do it a week. It just says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so we read, when you meet together, do these things. All things, Paul also says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So we need to also understand the context in which we live. My, as, as you know, my parents uh, served the Lord in, in the Philippines, taking Jesus to people that needed to know Jesus. And it was a very religious um, country. And there were people that would and wouldn't do certain things on Sunday. And so my parents, we, we didn't do certain things on Sunday because we didn't want to be offensive to the people that we're trying to take Jesus to. It never was in a legalistic point. And then we came back to the States, and uh, it was the end of eighth grade. Moved into Winona Lake uh, in Warsaw area. And uh, I remember that one, at, one Sunday afternoon, um, we, I was invited to go. We're going to go play tackle football. You remember those days, when you were young, crazy. You healed up a lot quicker than you do today. And so, yeah, we're playing tackle football. Uh, no pads, no helmet. You know how that works. And so I went to dad and I said, dad, can, can, can I go play with the guys? And he says, well, who's all going there? This is, as I recall the story, dad, the preacher's son is going to be there. <laughs> well, within that context, if he's allowed, then it's okay. You know, it wasn't like this is going to be offensive to people that we are, are with. And so, yeah, go fun, have fun, but don't come back with anything broken. So, and, and, and also we find that uh, Sabbath rest in Hebrews chapter 4, the author of Hebrews says Sabbath rest is kind of like the eternal rest that we'll have one day. It, it's rest in God's presence. While we're here, we work, we serve Jesus. But there's coming a point in time where we get a rest. There's a Sabbath day rest. So with that as a background, let's jump in and look at... Uh, there are two illustrations that Je Jesus gives to us to demonstrate to us that this Sabbath legalism and traditions that had been determined were not of God, all right? Didn't reflect the heart of God. 
The, the first illustration is given to us in verses 1 through 8. And, and it's to teach this, that God's laws are meant for our good. God's laws are meant for our good. So let's pick up the story beginning in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter, excuse me, of Romans. Sorry, you're there, I'm not. Now let's, let's try Matthew, okay? Let's try Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And it gives to us the setting. First of all, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath through the grain fields and his disciples became hungry and they began to pick the heads of grain and eat. Oftentimes in that time frame, you'd have fields on either side and you just had this narrow pathway that went, went, went in between the fields. And, and so it was legal and it was right. In fact, the Old Testament said you, you were allowed to. This wasn't stealing. Grain that was right beside the road, you had the ability to take and to eat and that was legitimate. Now, don't take a sickle and go out into the field and do a harvest. You know, that's, that's stealing. But you're allowed to walk this path and have grain on either side, wheat, barley, whatever it might be, corn, and, and you can eat of it if you're hungry. That's, that was understood. It was God's provision. And, and so on this particular Sabbath day, these disciples, Jesus and his disciples, are, are pretty hungry. And so they began to pick some heads of grain and they begin that process of eating it. Verse 2, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, behold, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. The, the not lawful was not anything that God had said. I hope you understand that by now looking at the background. There's nothing in Old Testament that says you can't do this. This was part of those uh, 300 years of saying, hey, you, you can't apply it in, in these particular ways. To, they really kind of violated it in four different ways. You harvested when you took it, and then, then when you uh, uh, separate the heads, that's another piece of work. And then if you blow the chaff away, that's winnowing. And then, then if you eat it, then, you know, you prepared food. And I mean, it was just, you know, like you violated this in four different ways. And so they're coming to Jesus, and how come you're doing, because Jesus is the teacher, so they're going directly to say, why are you allowing your disciples to do this? Now, the question is, how did they get there? You know, if you're only allowed a Sabbath day's journey, and there weren't that many Pharisees in this area, so, so how did they get there? Maybe some of you, you know, it, we, you tell your, your, your family, your kids, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to pray and thank God for the food. We bow our heads and, and to demonstrate humility, and, and we close our eyes not to be distracted. You know, it's not, you can pray with your eyes open. It's not like God says, oh, your eyes are open. And every once in a while, you have, maybe one of your children will tell on the other, hey, Susie didn't have her eyes closed. And the question is, how did you know? Right? So here, the, it's an interesting, we're not given the background, but the question is, how did they know? How did they know? But he said, Jesus said to them, have you not read what David did when he became hungry uh, and he and his companions? Now, David was seen as superhero to the Jewish community. And, and, and so... Jesus said, what about what David did? And, and, and so then we get into verse 4, and, and now he entered the house of God and the ate of the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but for the priests only. In other words, if you remember a little bit, we went through it some time ago, 2 Samuel, David's running along with his men from Saul who's trying to kill them. And he ends up at the, the tabernacle and he's there and he asks for, for some food. They're very hungry. And, and, and the high priest said, I, I, I don't have any food for you. I, the only thing I have is consecrated bread, often referred to as show bread. It was made uh, once a week and was set out for, for seven days. And at the end of seven days, the priests were the only ones who could eat it because they'd been separated, uh, sanctified uh, and set apart for God. And then they would, they would obviously bake new bread and they would put it out. It was an offering. It was a grain offering to God. And, and so the high priest said, hey, the only thing we have is this bread that's been sanctified that only the priests are allowed to eat. And the high priest took that bread that was sanctified and consecrated and gave it to David and his men. And he's not judged. He's not judged. And because laws are meant for our good, not for our evil. This was, this was kind of an exception. David didn't violate, and the high priest didn't violate. They're not accused of violating it. Sabbath does not restrict deeds of necessity. There are times that we go through, it's not a matter, well, you know, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, I really should do this, but it's, it's Sunday, and I, I just really... 
No, deeds of necessity. The yoke is not burdensome. So deeds of necessity are not restricted. There's a second illustration also in this part, picking up in verse 5. And that is that Sabbath doesn't restrict service for God. Look at verse 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? Okay, you're not supposed to work. But the priests did double work on the Sabbath day. They were serving God, but they're innocent. They're doing what they are required, what they are called upon to do. And, and so these rules and regulations that you have made, that are man-made rules and regulations, David would have been a violator of that, and your, high pri your priests would have been violators of that with all of these extra rules that you have made. That these rules are for our flourishing, not to be a burden. Priests work. Our praise team works. Come in and they sing and prepare and do all that kind of thing. And when they actually play the keys, you know, it sends a little electric spark and there's a little, light, you know, it's a little fire that's ignited there. It's, no. People who open the door for you. Those who serve in nursery, those who are involved in teaching, you know, it, it's, it's doing what God has called us to do. I know you're saying, well, you know, preachers, they only work one hour a day on a, on a you know, week, so, you know, they ought to be, in that. well, I get, you know. But when you're you know, serving God, you're allowed to serve God on Sunday, and, and we don't know what that might look like. It, and it's different. I worked on a farm for a couple of summers out in Colorado, and we did irrigation. We irrigated uh, sugar beets, and we irrigated hay, and we irrigated corn because it's pretty dry out there. The only thing we did on Sunday, and this, this was the, the, what the individuals who owned the farm did, we had to go move tubes, irrigation tubes. Otherwise, you'd flood out a field. And you could get really very legalistic about it and say, well, that's work. Well, yeah, it is, but it's a necessity. It's a necessity. Those of you who have been in dairy farming, you, you know the cows will say, hey, it's okay, it's Sunday. We'll wait till Monday. <laughs> You'd have a problem on your hands. And, 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 and so there, we don't have a right to judge someone else. It, it might be a necessity for what they're doing. And we do it with an co open conscience before God. And some, some individuals might be raised with this idea, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't get, I can't get to church because of health. And so I'm violating something. I can't get to church because of health. You're not violating God's principles. Some of you are watching online. And you don't need to ask God's forgiveness because you can't come and you can't get here. God knows that. God is merciful. He's gracious. He understands this. Be here if we could because there's a difference between meeting in person and not as far as interaction and abilities. But if we can't, it's not some great sin. And so Jesus said, here's what you need to know. And then Jesus clarifies a little bit in verse 6. But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. Notice it says something. Actually, it's... It's referring to himself, and he's using a quality instead of saying someone. He's referring to himself as being greater. So I'm greater, which is a tremendous claim because up at the top of the list of the Jewish community were those who were, that was the temple, was the temple. And Jesus said, there's someone, something, quality, I am greater than the temple. And then look at verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. They, these Jewish individuals were condemning. The religious leaders were condemning. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's in charge of the Sabbath. That does not mean that God makes rules and he gets to break them. What, G, what, God, what Jesus is saying in here is I'm the one who gave the, the, the observation about the Sabbath, so I know how it should work. You don't. And I do. So, so the first lesson that we learn is that law, God's laws are meant for our good. That's the Sabbath rest that we see here. The second lesson we find in verses 9 through 14, it's always right to do good. It's always right 
to do good. It says, and departing from there, he went into their synagogue. Now, you read it in Matthew, it almost sounds like this is the same day kind of thing. It's just saying it happened a little bit later. You go to to Luke, Luke tells us not, it was a different different Sabbath that Jesus entered into the temple. And we read this and going on in verse 10. Behold, there was a man with a withered hand, and they questioned him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him? So they kind of set him up. They set Jesus up. Here's here's a man with a withered hand. Again, I think it's Luke who says it's his right hand, which is pretty significant. You know, probably a right-hander. Sorry about those of you who are left-hand and live in a right-hand world that you understand some of the challenges. You know, if you're ambidextrous, great. You can do whatever you need, you know, with whatever hand you have. uh, So so in that context, here's a man with a right hand, which means he can't support himself. He can't work. That's pretty significant. But they're using him as a prop. They're using him to tempt Jesus. And so he, he's not been able to work. And so then Jesus asks the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And, and, and you know, they don't give an answer. Verse 11, and, and he said to them, what, shall, what man shall there be among you who shall have one sheep? And if it falls in a pit on a Sabbath... Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? You, you know, I mean, sometimes there's work you have to do on a farm. You have an animal that, that needs help. A farm, sometimes maybe, maybe because of a lot of rain, you, you got to deal something with a harvest, you know? Or Jesus said elsewhere, you know, you've got an animal that falls into a, a hole. You, you go about and you pull it out. And then you are more important, verse 12, you are more value than a sheep. People are more important. So if you can do this for an animal that is in distress, that needs help, you can help people on Sunday who need help. There was the Sabbath, right? Again, Sunday is is not the Sabbath. And so Jesus asked the question, and there's no response. And so Jesus said at the end of verse 12, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus says, Lord of the Sabbath says, it's lawful to do good. It's lawful. It's right. Always right to do good. It's always right to do good. And so Jesus said, it is lawful. And then in verse 13, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. Luke tells us, tells us that Jesus looked around in anger. Because here he asks, is it lawful to do something good to someone who has a need? They're not even going to answer that because it broke their rule. And Jesus is angry that because of rules that we make, we don't help those in need. And so he is angry at them. There's an interesting piece. I want to divert for just a little bit because um, there's an interesting illustration here about salvation. I hadn't really thought about it till I was doing some research. S. Lewis Johnson, who was a pastor of a church, he was also a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, taught theology, taught uh, Greek and, and Hebrew. And he stops and he pauses here to help us understand how does God work salvation? There's a song that says, I don't know how it works. You know, I don't know how God's grace came to me, but I know this, that I've trusted him whom I've committed and so how does salvation work? We, we hear individuals, you know, is it sovereignty of, of God or is it the free will of man? Did I just choose to follow Jesus or did God do something behind it? And he uses this as an analogy to help us understand what God does. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we're all born spiritually dead. Every single one of us, we are born spiritually dead. Dead people can't make the first move. It's not merely a metaphor. We're separated from God. We have nothing that really draws us toward him. Now, there are some who would tell us that within the, every human being, there's this divine spark that if you fan it just right, it bursts into flame and they become a follower of Jesus. Nowhere will you find that in Scripture. And so we're all born with being spiritually dead. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God begins to draw us to himself. We can't make that first move. But the Holy Spirit of God begins to draw us 
to himself. No one is saved on their own, but the Spirit begins to draw us, and we respond to what the Holy Spirit does. Now, here's the analogy that uh, S. Lewis Johnson said. You know, here's a man who's been crippled for a long time. We don't know how long. Maybe all of his life. And he was unable to move his hand. It was, a, it was impossible. And Jesus said to him, now move your hand, and he was able to move his hand. So if you would ask the man, did you stretch out your hand? Yes. Did you put your faith in Jesus? Yes. Did you do it by yourself? No. For years, I would have loved to have been able to stretch out my hand, but I couldn't until Jesus enabled me to be able to stick out my hand and begin to move it. And that's what happens with us, in us, dear friends. We cannot move toward God because we are spiritually dead until the Holy Spirit of God begins to move within us and to enable us to respond to the invitation of Jesus. We don't see all of that taking place behind the scenes. So that if you're here this morning and you have not yet put your faith and trust in Christ, you can say, it's, an, it's a legitimate prayer. God, help me to move there. Help me to go there. Help enable me to do that. That's what I want. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And when you come to understand who Jesus is and what he's done, then you put your faith and trust in him. Another illustration is that God tells us to, to, to make a clean heart, that we are to, to, to make your heart clean. We can't do that. And so we pray, create in me a clean heart, O God. You, you see, there, there needs to be a desire, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit to begin to work within us. And so we pray for maybe children who do not yet know Christ, begin to work in their lives to enable them to become followers of Jesus. Dan, did you, make, did you respond to the invitation of Jesus? Yes, I did. But it was because the Holy Spirit of God enabled me. And it was back under the ministry of a Filipino pastor in about fourth grade, Pastor Resurrection. How's that? It was in a boarding school. But it was the work of the Holy Spirit that began to work within me to prompt me and move me toward that. So you can pray. You say, well, I'm not there yet. But okay, start praying. God, I, I want to go there. That's the direction I want to go. Help me. Help me in that. And so we pray for a friend, we pray for a parent, we pray for a child, we pray for parents that God would work in their heart because spiritually dead people can't make the first move. And because we care about people around us who are lost and headed toward a Christless eternity, which every single one of us in this room are if we don't know Jesus. And so we pray, we pray. Well, lastly, we need to wrap it up. Verse, uh, verse 14 Pharisees went out and counseled together against him as to how they might destroy him. You know, you know, a couple times in there, Jesus really, really hammers it. Pharisees were considered to be the religious people that really understood their Bibles, you know, Old Testament. And Jesus said to them, haven't you read? Haven't you read? Oh, you might have read, but you don't understand. And here it says, they went out and counseled together. Again, Luke, I think it is, says they went, the Pharisees went out and raged that Jesus would dare do such a thing, to challenge them, that all of their rules and regulations that they had met were not honoring to God at all. You see, God didn't give us these rules and these commandments to make us miserable. God gives us principles and precepts for our human flourishing and not to be a burden. And the Sabbath principle started back in Genesis 2 is to be a blessing, worship and rest. Worship and rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you that, uh, that you work in us and you draw us to yourself. It's not because we decide that there's a spark that gets to be fanned into flame, but it's work of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus said elsewhere, no one comes except the Holy Spirit draws them. So, Father, I pray maybe there's some here this morning who are still wrestling with the claims of Christ, that they might be drawn toward Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God opens their eyes, helps them understand the truths, the realities. We don't have to have it all mastered at this point, just understanding 
the most important part of who Jesus is, God, who came down as a man and became a man to pay for our sins and our failures, and we're trusting him. When we stand before you, and you should, if you should say, why should I let you into my heaven? It's because Jesus invited me, and I'm trusting that what he said is true. So, Lord, if there's someone here, may that continue to be a work of yours in their heart, drawing them to yourself, understanding who Jesus is. Father, as we live our lives before you, may we understand that principles and precepts are for our flourishing, that Christianity is not a heavy burden of a lot of rules and regulations, though maybe, maybe we grew up in churches or surroundings where a lot of extra, uh, extra stuff was put on that your yoke is easy, that your burden is light. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? We're going to introduce a song to you. I think you'll catch on to it pretty soon. So please stand. And as you're able to join in, please join in.
Pastor Joe really said, I wouldn't know that song. He was right. I have no idea. Good words, though. Um, just a couple things before you head out. Um, so Pastor Doug is waiting out there with all his beautiful smoked meat. However, before you leave, pretty much all the chairs in the front section, we need moved to the back, to the back section, if you could do that for VBS. You have to do that first before you go out and get any food. <laughs> um, so happy Father's Day. Gentlemen, men, if you are here and you are raising a young son, teach them to be strong. Now, I don't mean going to the gym and working out. Hear, hear. Tell them that standing up for what is right is probably not going to make them popular, but it doesn't matter. And for you single women, single moms, excuse me, thank you for doing both. Have a good day.